today we have a, another great session, and I'm really pleased to be joined by Randy Commissar. And Randy, you can start your video now so we can see your face. We can see your picture, but there you are. Now you know why I'm in business, not in music. <laughs> I love it. I love it. What a great way to start. Uh, as I was telling you, Randy, I like to start every session with a song. Um, and this time it was Pink Floyd because the themes of it, of the song, the classic song, Time, ring true, especially with the kind of topic that you're talking about today. So it's, it's great to have you. No, it's a pleasure to be here, Peter. Thanks for, thanks for having me. I, I love the idea of this university. It's such a, such a great concept and inspiration. Well, it's, and the enthusiasm of people like you coming in and being part of it, that's, that's wonderful. And, and today, uh, for, for everybody out there who's watching um, both live and then we'll be, of course, placing this video on demand because a lot of people will look at it that way. The topic today is a really interesting one. I think very timely too. the the art of creating a life while making a living, which is so relevant as we think about the tools and the relationships and some of the themes that we've talked about in Creative University. But, you know, ultimately it's about uh, yes, you want to have a career that's, that's a, it provides what you want it to provide and you achieve what you want to achieve, but achievement is a very broad term and having a fulfilling life and being passionate is the perfect, like that's the ultimate, if you can do that. And, and Randy, I've talked about nonlinear paths before too, <laughs> where you don't put too much pressure on yourself, students out there to get it right, to thread the needle, because the question of what is right is, um, it, it, it's a very personal one. And you will be surprised by some of the decisions that you make have many unintended consequences, some positive, some not so much, but it's part of the journey. And so Randy is the quintessential, um, I would say Renaissance man, actually, Randy, really, when I look at your background, true Renaissance man, who's, you've had a nonlinear path that is fascinating. And we'll get into that. So thrilled to have you. No, um, Rand, Randy is an investor at Kleiner, Kleiner Perkins, one of the top venture capitalists in the world, um, venture capital firms. He'll describe what that is a little bit. Um, he's a best-selling author. He's taught business classes at Stanford. He started as a student. Um, he started promoting music concerts while at school. That ultimately led to law school in some kind of interesting way, which ultimately led to all kinds of things, working at Apple as a senior counsel, um, becoming a founding director of TiVo, a CEO of several companies, to on and on and on, including a journey into New Zealand that he'll talk about too. But really quickly to begin before we get into the conversation, so again, I'm not gonna go through this in great detail, but I always like to uh, remind people what Creative University is all about, and it's about you guys. And so we're trying to make this as meaningful to you as, as we can. So we, we're taking the, f the feedback and the input. So as an example, one student had an idea of, because of all the issues you're facing, and you're facing a lot of them, that um, talking about mental health, and so we want to build that in and randy's topic is perfect and so we can touch upon that too and by the way during this session send your questions for randy in via the chat feature or the q a feature either way uh and then i will read them to randy and so this is a colloquy you know we can we don't have to wait till the end we'll just kind of play it by ear but the why the what the goals giving you democratized access to break into the business that's a key part of it so anybody has a chance, if you're passionate and you're dedicated, to give you real um, exposure to great minds like Randy's. And we've had a great, um, you know, we, we've had a nice lineup already. You see the upcoming lineup. Just confirmed today on August 18th, Jenny Morris, who's a senior, senior vice president and head of content over at HBO Max, is going to be joining. And Jenny's great and has an amazing career and you know, obviously a lot of responsibility. She'll talk then too. But then it's, it's democratized access, access to great minds, but the goal is to give you immediate relationships that could be meaningful to you to help, help you jump across that velvet rope into the business. And then that could lead to mentorships, immediate internships too. And 
again, today, I just learned that there's another internship that was made available from a great company. So like real things are happening. It's, it's very gratifying and it's because of you guys. So there's a lot more. The next session is gonna be next Tuesday and with Rachel Craig and it's a live conversation about the A&R business in the music world. And she's also been on the live event side in production. She's with Indie Label Network Music Group and she's wonderful. Interestingly, she's also getting her executive MBA right now, even though she's done all these things and continues to do them. So it's gonna be, it will be fascinating to get her perspective. After that, as I told you, my favorite artist of the last 10 years, Ben Cooper, Radical Face, talking about the creative process. Rachel actually represents him, but he's an award-winning artist, amazing artist, um, and just the creative process. He's more than just music. He's a fascinating individual. And then we have Jeff Clanagan, president of Kevin Hart's Laugh Out Loud Network coming up. Uh, Sarah Harden, CEO of Reese Witherspoon's Hello Sunshine, uh, and so much more. If you want more, go to the creative.university website, of course, um, creative.media website, look at the tab for Creative University. Reach out to Luisa at creative.media, L-U-I-S-A at creative.media if you have any questions, if you'd like anything, or you can reach out to me anytime too. So that's a lot, I know. And I'm gonna stop the share so we can just see, just see Randy, okay. So there it is. <laughs> well, I just want to reiterate what you, uh, the, the audience, those watching today, help me out here. It's very hard to do these things because I'm not in a room with you. I can't read the body language. I don't know if I'm on track or off track. So your questions will help a lot to make sure that I'm giving you what I can. I'm here really just to share my experience. I'm not going to tell you what to do because nobody can tell you what to do. But hopefully there'll be things in my experience that will be helpful to you, maybe signposts along the way, things you would do completely differently or things that you may think may be helpful. And that's why I'm here. So whatever you can get from me, that's, that's, um, that, that's what I'm hoping for. Great, Randy. That's, that's wonderful. Again, wonderful to have you. So there are so many different places where we can begin, but just let's do one quick logistical thing so people understand what a venture capitalist is, mm -hmm. and then we'll get into the journey and, and what the topic is. So for the last 15 years or so, I have been, oh, one second, let me turn. For the last 15 years or so, I have been working with a group called Kleiner Perkins Caulfield and Myers here in Silicon Valley. Um, they're, they're what's called a venture capital firm. They, they take other people's money, largely pension fund money, endowment money from universities, and they invest it in startups. They look for areas of innovation that might create great businesses that allow them to make substantial returns, but not in traditional businesses, but in new businesses, whether that's in companies like TiVo, or in Netflix, or whether that's in companies like SpaceX or Tesla, venture capitalists tend to provide the first money because these are just ideas at that point. They're not bankable. You can't go into a, to, uh, into a Wells Fargo um, branch office and take a loan to start one of these businesses. You need to convince somebody to take a big risk. And so we're risk capital. We invest other people's money in high risk ventures that we hope can provide extraordinary new businesses and great returns. Yeah, great. And, and by the way, for all of you out there, Kleiner Perkins is one of the blue chippiest venture firms mm -hmm. that's out there. So it's, it's uh, in, in the heart of Silicon Valley, Kleiner Perkins is at the very, very top of lists where, where entrepreneurs would love to get partner their capital and their partners from. So it's a wonderful firm. So Randy, where would you like to begin as you tell your story and give insights about your own career and how you approached it and how you made your decisions along the way and what drives you, your motivations? Well, I think it's, it's probably good to touch upon the beginning because it gives people some sense of the common basis from where I came from and where they are today. And so it, it, um, it makes it all much more relevant, I think, and accessible because, I mean, I just grew up in a 
middle-class suburb in upstate New York as a kid. I was good in school, um, good at sports, but, but relatively bored being in a small environment and, um, and trying many new things. I was, I was very um, disturbed, I think, about my prospects being in this small, dreary, gray town and um, looking for my way out. Um, I was the first one in my, in my family to go to college. University was my way out. And I end up transferring to a university in New England, ultimately, where I, um, where I really started my education, where I learned how to learn, where I spent my time sort of building a basis of skills and understanding that has served me really well today. It was a it, it, and, and it was a, a really good sort of general purpose education, um, not anything in particular. I wasn't an engineer. I didn't go into the sciences. I just got a very standard, good liberal arts education. But it prepared me for the opportunities that I was able to stumble upon, really stumble upon in my life thereafter. Yeah, stumble upon, but really like take action with too. So how... Do, your first um, meaningful way out or way into what you were passionate about. Tell us about that a little bit. Well, you know, I must say, coming into the university um, through performing well in school and high school and getting to the university, I was very much used to jumping other people's hurdles. Um, I was running somebody else's race all the time, and I was running it well, but fundamentally it was never my race. You know, I was always doing what was expected. I was doing what people prescribed. I was following what I thought would be the best route to ultimately get someplace, though I wasn't sure what that was, but it, it looked like a middle-class lifestyle with two cars and a family and a house in the suburbs, and I was just running that race as fast as I could. And I think the transformation for me occurred later in college when it became clear to me that running somebody else's race, even if you could win it, wasn't necessarily going to be very satisfying or fulfilling. And I began to have a lot of doubts, a lot of doubts about what I was doing and why I was doing it. And as I looked around at the outcomes, as I looked around and saw the people who were living the lives that I thought I wanted to live, it was clear to me that I needed to do something different, that I needed to express myself, and I needed to engage my own passions if I was truly going to be fulfilled, not just successful. Yeah, so that fulfillment was part of your definition of success for you. Yes, very much so. I mean, you know, that I think success is a, is a, is a funny term because, um, particularly for young people with a very limited set of options, the success looks like um, jumping through other people's hurdles. And I, ultimately, for me, uh, as an adult, what's become clear to me is success is fulfillment. It's not about having a lot of things or being, or, or being a celebrity or any of those, um, those iconic uh, careers that you think about as being the promised land. The reality is that I had the good fortune, very young, to be exposed, for instance, to lots of people in the rock and roll business when I was in the rock and roll promotion business. And what, I began, what became clear to me, and has become clear to me throughout my career as I've dealt with billionaires and celebrities and, um, and, and politicians, that by and large, those trappings of success don't necessarily go hand in hand with fulfillment, satisfaction, or happiness. And, and frankly, I actually feel it was a blessing for me to realize that early on. Because if you're unhappy, especially if you're young and unhappy, you believe that you're just doing something wrong, right? You just have to do, you have to do something else. You have to do something better. You should be doing what people are telling you to do because obviously that's made them happy. So that's what would make you happy. And, and I think the problem is, as you look around at all of these, particularly now, it's, it's overwhelming, you know, in Instagram, Facebook, you look around at everybody else's perfect life 
Yeah. And you think, my goodness, how do I get there? Only to realize that their lives aren't perfect. Doesn't matter how, how big their house is or how famous they are. They have all sorts of issues, personal and otherwise. And it's really important to deviate from the path and find your own if you're truly going to be happy and you're going to do something that I think is pleasurable and passionate in your life. Which is so, um, you know, to a certain extent for at least many of us, it sounds kind of obvious that that's the case, but it's so hard to do because there, and we talk about this as a family quite a bit, it's that there's a certain path that is almost like expected by people around you even sometimes. And you, you know, trying to, um, live the authentic life of what's authentic to you, you know, to you. And again, what I love about your nonlinear journey is that when, when I describe you and announce you because there's just limited amount of space on the, on the promotional material as being that with Kleiner Perkins, I think there's, there's like, because it's such a powerful venture capital fund, I think a lot of people say, you know, I have this definition of what a venture capitalist is. Right. And then, um, the, but you have, you came to it in such a unique way and with such a different kind of non-traditional way. And also all along the way, you made some decisions that were not about the pocketbook. You know, you, you clearly did many, many of your decisions based on your gut, your, your feeling like it wasn't right for you. So you went a different path and, um, and that has led you to be able to have the kind of fulfillment that you've had and tell other people about it in your best-selling books and things like that. Um, I wanted to, but go ahead. And I want to ask you. Well, yeah. So I, I, you know, in terms of, you know, my career only making sense in the rear view mirror, um, because I really didn't have a plan for it. I still don't have a plan for it. It's not over by any means. I don't know what's next. Um, I'm pretty sure I don't want to continue being a venture capitalist. I've, I've done that, enjoyed much of it. There were lots of it I didn't like, and now it's time to do something else. I, what, what I've really, what, if I look back at one thing, one theme that's made my life work for me, it's, it's being able to effectively choose good opportunities when they arise, not make the opportunity happen. And, and, and that's the other thing that I think is really important. I spent a lot of my early life, like young people all do, learning skills and competencies, being prepared for whatever is coming next. Um, and then I probably spent the next bit of my life trying to make myself interesting, you know, doing interesting things, you know, meeting interesting people, trying different things. Um, the, next, the next chapter of my life was really more about developing my character. It's about, it's about plumbing, plumbing who you are, what your values are, expressing those values in what you do. It, I, I'm a practicing, I practice Buddhism and there's this concept in Buddhism called right livelihood. And so trying to align what you do with your values um, and impact is actually incredibly tricky in this society. It's very, very tricky. And, and so navigating that was sort of the next big chapter of my life. And now I'm in this chapter of my life, which is really about giving back and being part of the community I consider that very spiritual to me, you know, yeah. being in, in relationship with community and others. And that's, that's kind of why I'm here and why I do what I do today. But when I look back at all of that, the, the important thing for me was I prepared myself for opportunities. I, if, I, if there were two things that I'd recommend to any young person today, it's focus in on the people that you work and relate to the quality of those people, the quality of their character, the quality of their values, the quality of their work, the quality of their creativity, the quality of their passion, and then focus in on the opportunities that come out of those relationships. All of my opportunities came out of relationships. Hmm. Um, every single one of them was somebody who appreciated me or my work, who pointed somebody to me or me to them that gave me the opportunity. And then all I had to do was be good enough to make the decision which opportunity to take. And frankly, a lot of those opportunities, I'm not sure they're right or wrong. You know, I went to law school. Should I go to law school? Should I go to art school? Should I have done something else? Who knows? But, but the reality was in each one of those opportunities, when I saw them, I had a foundation, a, uh, a framework 
for which I could decide whether I wanted to do it or not. It was based upon passion. It was based upon values. It was based upon curiosity. I mean, I would do so many things just because I hadn't done it before. And, they, and that was interesting to me. Yeah. And so being able to filter opportunities, being able to establish a strong network of relationships is key to navigating this career in the rear view mirror. So by the way, one, that's such a critical thing. Well, you said many critical things there, but the power of relationships, which as I've, I've hammered home like over and over again, because they've been hammered home to me in all these sessions that we've had, I found that in my life, you found it in your life. You know, um, last week when we were speaking with John and on and on and on. So the most fundamental thing that will lead you to your own promised land most likely is gonna be a relationship, just like Randy said, where somebody who you respect, who you value believes in you. And because you've demonstrated something to them, which could be just your passion alone for what you wanna do, which is so important to authentically go for the things that you want. Um, Anum asks a question for you. How do you prioritize which opportunities to take on and which to pass up? Mm -hmm. it's, it's super tricky. And, and it really comes down to trying to overlay my interests my competencies, right? And then um, whether I see that opportunity as opening up other opportunities. Let me be really clear about that last thing. Um, I don't know if you play pool. I, I love playing pool. And in playing pool, it's always about setting up the next shot, not just land, not just putting the ball, the, the current ball in the pocket. It's setting up the next shot while doing that. And, and I see opportunities the same way. So for instance, when I went to law school, I went to law school after having worked as a grunt in a music production business um, for a while, amongst other things. I also ran, helped run a community development program, and I, I taught economics at a cooking school. So that was, that's what I did when I graduated. There weren't a lot of jobs. Love it. Um, Love it. Uh, it, it, it. Maybe not as bad as now, but it was pretty bad. In, in any event, what what... I went to law school and I thought, oh, I'm going to come out and I'm going to go music business. That's what I'm going to do. I love music. Uh, I'd been working in music. I'd, I'd been working in it enough at that point to realize that it had its, uh, it had its blemishes. But nevertheless, I, was, I thought that was my path. And interestingly enough, in, in law school, it became clear to me that there was this opportunity in technology in California that, uh, you know, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak were suddenly on the cover of magazines, these kids my age who were out there changing the world. And I looked at that versus music and I thought, well, the thing about music is it's pretty well defined. Yeah, you can, the industry's the industry, you know? Yeah, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a wrinkle here and a change there. But the dynamics of the technology business was completely unfathomable. I, there were so many new things happening all the time. And so I cast my fate in technology. Now, you may say, well, I, I, I turned down create the, the creative life for the business life, but no contraire. The technology life was is an incredibly creative life. And, and, and that was the other lesson for me, which is I had defined creativity very narrowly. You know, it was film, it was music, it was, it was, it was writing and publishing. Um, but then I began to realize creativity is everywhere, in, in every field if you find the right opportunity. And so for me, the creative life I've lived in Silicon Valley and the many different ways in which I've expressed that, whether it's a, as a CEO or venture capitalist, a founder, a, a teacher, a writer, that to me has been um, a great uh, font of opportunities. And then choosing the right opportunity is that overlay of what am I good at right now what, what, what do I want to learn? What's interesting to me? And, um, and what's consistent with my values, which is key. I mean, doing something inconsistent with their values, even if the other things line up, is a recipe for failure. Yeah, yeah. No, again, I, I love it. And, and one of the reasons why uh, I completely agree, again, with how you define creativity, too, because it, it is not narrow. In any field, it's... Uh, uh, it, it's, any field can be creative, any field can be creative, whatever it is. And so that's one of the reasons why, again, for Creative University, it's so critical to get diverse voices from diverse roles. So it's not just one or the other. And so one week we can have an artist like 
Ben Cooper radical face. And another week we can have somebody who part of what, just part of your profile is that you're an investor in a venture capital fund, but all these other elements that we talked about, that's the goal. The goal is so that for you, for you students out there, you may even have in your mind an idea of what you absolutely want to do. Mm. Uh, but unless you're exposed to a broad set, I wish I had been earlier exposed to many more things. And so my mind was more open. I don't have any regrets, but I think that it's certainly, it's good to know all these different things. It may get you thinking in a different kind of way, which may lead to a different relationship that might take you in a different kind of door. Um, yes, yes. I, 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 I think it's very important to be conscious of, of exactly what your opportunity set looks like at any single moment and why you're making decisions you're making. And to the extent, in my first book, The Monk and the Riddle, I talk about the deferred life plan, which is the idea of, of making the wrong decision because you believe it's important that you do that in order to be able to make the right decision later and how oftentimes that leads you off the, the, the track and you never get to the right decision, you never get to the right opportunity because you're so busy now on this wrong path. So making sure that you see opportunities for what they are and also see them as, you know, when I'm in an opportunity, it is everything for me. It is my whole life. But I also realize it will end. And I also realize there will be another one. And I also realize I'll have another decision to make. And so I prepare myself mentally for that. And it took a while. I mean, frankly, the first couple of ones were extremely awkward and uncomfortable. I had no idea whether or not I could recover, for instance, from, from resigning as a CEO to take a job that didn't exist before that I was creating called virtual CEO. I had no idea whether that would work. I had no idea whether I, you know, writing a book at the height of the dot-com boom that basically called out um, the participants for their lack of adherence to the, to the, to the passion and the, and, and the enthusiasm, the, the optimism of entrepreneurship. I had no idea that that book would be a bestseller and lead me to a teaching position at Stanford. I had, I had no idea. I know that whenever I did one of those things, I did it with everything I had because it's what I believed in strongly at that moment. And it developed my confidence over time that each one of those moments, each one of those doors clo opened and shut, led to 10 more doors that I would have to choose from later. So Chris, I'm going to get to your question in a second, but I just want to follow up with you, Randy, on one thing. So I understand it correctly, your perspective, which is um, you mentioned that you, you feel like in your book, you talk about the fact that you get on the a, like in a wrong opportunity and the right opportunity doesn't ultimately doesn't come because you've gone down a path too far. But does that mean you feel like um, you have to be absolutely sweet spot on day one as you enter, as you leave school, or uh, I'm curious yeah. to get your perspective on that. I, because I want, I want everybody to understand yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think, it, and, a, and a lot of people, in my first book, a lot of people um, take out that particular piece around passion and drive. Passion being that thing that pulls you to something, drive being that, that, that resiliency, that grit that pushes you towards something. And, and when you're pushing towards something, it may not be the right thing. That pull is normally, in my mind, is, is, is that's what I have the confidence in. When I sense that pull, that's when I feel like I'm moving in the right direction. When I'm pushing, even if I'm competently doing that, even if I'm quote unquote successfully doing that, um, that oftentimes leads me astray. And so the, the important thing about that is um, a lot of people say, well, I don't know what my passion is. I mean, tell me what my passion is. And I, when I was teaching at Stanford, so many students would walk into my office and say, help me find my passion. And I would go, wait a minute, that, that, you, you must have many passions, not just one passion, many passions. And so the real, the real trick is aligning your passion with the opportunities that are available to you. So at any single time, you may not have the opportunity to do what you think think your ultimate passion is. Let's say your ultimate passion is to be, you know, a film director. And you're looking around for a film director opportunity. Well, guess what? Nobody's going to give you a film director opportunity. But 
maybe there's an opportunity for you to do something on somebody else's project or something online or something in the game business or something that excites you that is going to allow you to learn to network with important with people that I think will, can be important to you long term, um, people with whom you share values and opportunities. And that's, that's the, that turns out to be the overlay of passion and opportunity that you need to look for at any single moment. Realizing that this idea that you have about what you should or want to do may actually be wrong, but certainly may not be available to you at any single moment. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting. So it doesn't necessarily mean that the, if you follow this kind of almost like a path of least resistance where it's a natural pulling you in, it doesn't necessarily mean it's the perfect something that you had in your mind and mistakes will be made along the way. But um, I, I see your point there that it, it's one takeaway I would get at, out of it and tell me if this is right, is let's say you're a young person in school and you're exploring um, some area that you believe that is really drawing you in that don't put too much stock in at least early on in terms of what the title is you know what the those kinds of things it's more important to learn to get into it establish the relationship right is that kind of absolutely you know and that goes back to the, what i was saying earlier about how i thought i was going to be in the music business right because because i love music i mean look at Look at young people and their interests, by and large. You know, by and large, they're going to be interested in music. They're going to be in video games. They're going to be into 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 theater or into uh, into movies. And so that's what they're into. So that's kind of what they think they should do. And um, and it took me a while to realize that while I love music, I still love it today. Um, while I love film, um, while I actually really enjoy writing, the reality is that there's so many different outlets for that creativity that I didn't even know existed, which is of course why you're doing this and why I'm here today, is to let people look, understand that creative opportunities are around them every day. It's really kind of finding that opportunity, that, that wrinkle, and that you can that enter into, and then entering into it with the right mindset. This mindset of, I am going to create here. I'm not going to simply perform, I'm going to create. Yeah. No, perfect. And, and creativity and, and another part of your journey is that, like you said, you put everything into it. And then once you've lost, lo not lost, but you fulfilled that aspect of something you were pursuing, then your path has been you've moved on to something else. And frequently, they're very different things. And so it's so some of you may be singularly focused and it may be the perfect life for you ultimately to go into a certain path and stay in a relative area. Let's just use the film director or the film project sort of example, which is wonderful. But some may take the more nonlinear path um, as you have, which is personal to you, authentic to you. Okay, so let me take a question from Chris. Family is very important to me, but there can be many conflicting values. How do you nurture your most important relationships when there is a conflict of values. <laughs> wow. So, so, I mean, I mean, I'm facing this right now with my family as I, as we look at the political landscape, um, certainly not with my immediate family, my wife and I are in complete agreement, but as you can imagine, extended families uh, from different places and different ages have different views of the world. And it's so hard. It's so hard. I mean, the, the, so it kind of like what I do with creativity, I have to keep abstracting, right? So, so rather than simply say, we don't share values, I need to dig down and tease that apart more. We may disagree on a particular um, uh, solution or resolution or policy, but if I tease that away, do I find some agreement? between us about what's important. Do I find some, under, some shared understanding that may lead us to two different points of view, but are nevertheless based upon values that I can respect and share with them? And so it's really important. It is an exercise that I've had to do to, to move beyond the superficial and go deeper to try to understand where the deviation really is. It, is it a values deviation or is it a judgment deviation or is it an experience deviation? Because frankly, I find 
working with or relating intimately with people whose values are diametrically opposed to mine to be almost impossible. Um, I, I can do that in a cordial way. I can do that in a business-like way, but I can't do it in an intimate way. I can't, I can't have that sort of intimate relationship with people whose values are so fundamentally different. Yeah. But it's really important to understand the difference is the difference one of values or is the difference one of experience or judgment? When I graduated from university, I was, you know, a young socialist, um, like most of my peers, and I went into local government. I, I went to work um, for the mayor's office of community development in the city of Providence. Um, a, a, an incredible character named Buddy Cianci. Look him up. Um, uh, Buddy, what, twice. What, what, Buddy, Buddy Cianci, crazy, crazy character. What an experience that was. Loved it. Um, but insane. In, in any event, um, I worked in an office where uh, the guy across the way from me, who was also one of the managers, um, was a diehard Republican conservative, right? Diehard Republican conservative. And so I thought for sure we were just not going to agree. And I was surrounded by all of these progressive people that, uh, that sort of shared my political view. And I began, to, but six months later, if you asked me the most important relationship I had in that, in, that, um, in that office, it was with that diehard Republican conservative. And the reason was, unlike a lot of the progressives who just sort of mouth the same progressive political points of view that I was hearing and seeing everywhere, this conservative challenged me. And what I realized is the challenge wasn't that we disagreed on values. We actually agreed a lot on values. We disagreed on how to get there. And I had to respect his point of view on how to get there, just like he had to respect mine. And so that was a really important lesson for me early in my life, thank God, because it let me understand that um, having different points of view is not having different values. Yeah, interesting. So several more questions, and we're going to have to go kind of rapid fire because there's several questions. Um, so Mirabel asked this question. She's a, a fellow Stanford alum and wanted to say thank you for, for hosting this talk, first of all. The question is this. Even though you had no idea whether or not your ambitions or ideas would end up doing well, what drove you to take the risk anyway? What kind of mental framework did you adopt? Yeah. Well, it, you know, part of it's probably hardwired in genetics, you know. I mean, frankly, the me, the biggest risk was not doing what I cared about. That was the biggest risk. The biggest risk wasn't failing. That was never the biggest risk. And, 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 and I want to put that in perspective because um, it's really important to understand that, that a, a key part of my life was making sure that my lifestyle was always constrained, meaning... I never lived big and I never expected to live big. I always, my, my, I, I managed my lifestyle, not around how much money I made, but around um, per, giving me the opportunity to say no. By the way, just, I want to stop you on that a little bit again, because the knee jerk reaction about venture capitalists <laughs> is not that. Yeah, of course, of course. And I, and, and frankly, that's, if you had to generalize, I am not, I would not be, the generalization. You know, the generalization is in, in a field that's dominated by money, money and, this, and, the, and the emblems of money and power are very, you know, are very prominent. It's not what had brought me to the profession. I can tell you, what, I'll, I'll tell you what brought me to the profession in a second, but, but it's my whole life has been built around creating the financial options to pursue the road less traveled to take okay. that risk. And, you know, even today, when I look at my bank account, I'm shocked. It's, it, it's completely divorced from what I, how I live my life. I, I live well, I, I'm a happy guy, I'm, I'm taken care of, but, but you know, <laughs> I, mean, I, I have a 1992 or 86 motorcycle, right? That's what I, you know, I have my, my, my I ride a bicycle more than I drive a car. I, you know, I, I, you know, I live in California, so houses are expensive, but they are not grand. And so I've always built into my life the option to follow a route that isn't necessarily going to provide me with the trappings of success. 
Yeah. And that, that has been key to me because that has allowed me to stay curious, to, to try new things that aren't necessarily going to pay off. And it's a mindset that actually was very important to being a venture capitalist because in venture capital, most projects fail. It's probably the only business I know where you can fail more than you succeed and still make a good living. Mm -hmm. And it's just because of the way the business is built up. And I said, I would tell you why I became a venture capitalist. I was resistant to being a venture capitalist. I'd been an entrepreneur. I'd done the virtual CEO gig, which worked really well. It's interesting. Got written up by Harvard, became a thing, you know, much to my surprise, led to the book, led to work at Stanford. When I was invited by Kleiner Perkins to become a venture capitalist, um, the reason I joined, was because they were committed to trying something different. They were going to invest substantially in green and sustainable ventures to try and create a world that was going to be free of fossil fuels. That was a big part of what they wanted to do. And they had the clout, the money, and the relationships to do that that I didn't. And so when I had to weigh the balance, and it was a balancing act. It wasn't obvious that this is what I should do or wanted to do. Um, I basically had to say, this is a unique opportunity. I'm never going to get this again. It, it opens up other opportunities down the road. And even though it comes with some downside, I should uh, monitor that downside, make sure I don't fall prey to it, and try that. And that's what I ended up doing for 15 years as a venture capitalist, that project. Which takes a lot of uh, mental, um, uh, using your term, mental, uh, well, this is mental constraint, constraining uh, when you have all this noise around you to staying true to your own path, I commend you for that because that's not, that's easier said than done. That's, well, that, that is, that is every, I've been meditating every day for 28 years, never miss the day. And if I don't do that, I, I am, I am prone to falling off course. Okay. So I'm going to have a separate session with you <laughs> because I need to learn how to do that. <laughs> I haven't built that into my life yet, but I need to build it into my life. So Bo, I'm gonna to get to your question in a second, but I'm gonna to get to, um, there's a question from somebody saying, this situation is common, having to make a very critical decision that will impact your future with limited data and ambiguous context. I found that it is impossible to make the right decision, thus it's more important to make our decision right. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah, no, I, I, I commend that, by the way. So my, my life, I mean, certainly my, 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 the last 15 years of my career as a venture capitalist is about just that. In venture capital, we don't have data, right? Somebody walks in with an idea. We don't know whether it's going to work. We don't know what they can do it. They don't know what, what the customers care about it. So with limited information, we have to make multi-million dollar bets all the time, all the time. And... Um, and I, you know, what I've done in, 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 um, in this business, I, there are sort of three stages. There's the apprentice stage, the journeyman stage, and the master stage. And so in the apprentice stage, when you're first starting in this business, you spend all your time thinking, there must be a set of rules. There's algorithms here. I got I to figure out what the algorithms are. When I figure out the algorithms, then I'll just be able to do this. And then as a journey person, a journeyman, you basically decide that you're going to perfect the rules. You now sort of know the rules. Now you're just going to, you're going to practice those rules till you are the best at them. And then as a master, you forget the rules because you begin to realize that the rules are just constraints. They're just history. They're nothing to do with the future. And so what I've done in my career, particularly in venture capital is every year, I would probably I start off with a list of things I would look at, you know, how to think about the business and try to do what you're talking about, which is make a decision with limited information. And I've come down to basically only three things, three things. And one of them is, what's the quality of the people? Who are these people? Why are they, do why are they doing this? Are they doing it just to make money? Are they doing it because they love it? Are they doing it because they have to? Are they doing it because they have a chip on their shoulder and they need to prove themselves? Those, so that's really important. The next thing is, what problem are they solving? Is the problem so important that it's worth failing at? Not succeeding at, failing at, because most ventures fail. So if I'm going to fail, I'm not going to fail on some stupid little venture. I'm going to fail on some big honking venture, right? <laughs> That's how I'm going to go fail. It, it, it go down, burn it. And then the, the, the fourth thing is, does it provide value to others? You know, we think about the economy. It's about money. It's about buying loads. It's about selling. No, 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 no. 
the, the economy is about one thing, creating value for others. Now, we can argue about how it operates and does it operate well, and boy, it's, it has a lot of problems, but fundamentally, as economic beings, our job in life is to create value for others and thereby for ourselves in the process. And so those are the only three things I end up looking at. But I spend my life making decisions with limited information. And by the way, so will you and so will everybody else. So get comfortable with it. Yeah. By the way, that was just very inspiring. That was really interesting to hear you lay out the three things that were our fundamental tenets in terms of how you approach problems. So Bo had a question, and it's related to that. What's a, simula what's a simula similarity that you've noticed between the most successful startups at Kleiner Perkins that they've funded? The similarity amongst those companies that have been most successful. Um, they're unpredictable. So, you know, even, and even late into them, I mean, there was a time in, in early in Google's life when I know the partners at Kleiner Perkins were wondering whether they made the right decision to invest in Google. So even three or four years into some of these, you can't tell whether or not you've got a, gr you've got a great business. There's a lot of luck involved, a lot of luck involved. And, and most venture capitalists don't like to acknowledge that because it somehow feels like it diminishes their prowess if they acknowledge luck, guess what? We are all probabilistic beings. We're all living in a world where opportunity occurs outside our control, and it's our job to figure out how to navigate that. We don't control the results. We don't control the opportunities. We have to learn how to, to navigate between them. And so understanding and appreciating luck, to me, the humility of understanding and appreciating luck is key to being successful in being able to back new ideas and to move into areas with limited information. So let that, me test that. Let me test that a little bit. So there's no question. I, I completely agree with you violently about like the, I kind of call it serendipity mm. um, rather than luck in a, but it's a very subtle sort of distinction. What I, at least what, forget what I'm thinking about for you, how do you maximize your opportunities? Mm. Because when you're talking about that, like even your, your first relationship that got you on the way or your first opportunity, how do you put yourself as a student out there who can learn from you? Okay, how do we put some of that in practice? What can we do? Let me give you an example. So I'll give you an example. So, so I'm at Apple, it's 1986, 85, 86, Steve Jobs had just left, I had just come. I'd actually been um, outside counselor George Lucas when he sold Steve Pixar and that's how I sort of got to Apple through the lawyer connection because I was in that deal. So I end up at Apple and, um, and, I, and I'm, I worked there about a year and it becomes clear to, and I love the place, but it becomes clear that being a lawyer at Apple is not that interesting. And so I'm thinking I'm gonna leave. And, um, and one day, there's this guy who's, who's since become incredibly famous and important in the Valley, a guy named Bill Campbell. Look him up. He's, he was kind of the coach to all of the great successes here in Silicon Valley. He was, a, he was Steve Jobs' coach. He was Larry and Sergey's coach. He was Jeff Bezos' coach. He has been the coach to so many great people. And he was a college football coach before he came to Apple and became the sales vice president. He was the vice president of sales and marketing when I was there. I was working in legal. He was working over in sales and marketing. And so our lives were like this. I was always telling him what he couldn't do. He was always trying to break the rules. That was our life. That's kind of the deal. A year after I'm there, he comes marching. And we do not know each other well. But the only time we ever meet is in these meetings when we are fighting with each other, right? That's it. He comes marching down the hall one day, and I'm in my office, grabs me, pulls me into a, a, a dark conference room. The lights are off. Doesn't sit down. Looks at me and says, tomorrow I'm spinning off the Apple software company called Claris. Um, it became called Claris. The time was the Apple software company. I was spinning it off. I'm going to need some co-founders. I want you to join me. Now, I'm looking at this guy. I don't know this guy. I, I have no, he hasn't told me what the job is. He hasn't told me what I'm going to get paid. He hasn't told me anything. And he looks at me and says, I need to know now. What do you do? I made the smartest decision in my life. I said, yes. And the reason it was the smartest decision in my life is first of all, he's one of the most amazing people I've ever had a chance to work with. I learned, I learned so much about not just business, but life and leadership from this man. But he also created huge opportunity wake for me going forward. Everybody came to Bill. 
And, every, and by the way, this was not part of my thinking when I made that decision. Bill wasn't Bill, wasn't Bill at the time, right? And I made that decision because, you know what? I wanted to do a startup. I was curious. I was bored with what I was doing. Yes, I was, make, I was gonna make less money. Yes, I, would, I mean, none of these things matter to me because I'd set my life up to take advantage of these sorts of opportunities. And so what looked like a reckless move, if I had gone to my parents and said, you know what, I just made this decision in 30 seconds in a, in a dark office with, to, to join this guy and leave a really good job, a really good job with a great future at Apple, they would have said, what are you doing? How do you, you, you're, you're, that, how do you make those decisions? And I'll tell you, I made decisions. I made decisions of a value and gut. And that's ultimately what you've got to develop through your life, through your experience. Set. Yeah. So we don't have too much time left. By the way, if anybody else has questions, bring them in um, so we can get to them. But I have a question about the kind of bringing it back. I think it's, you know, there's some universality to it right now with people who are watching this. I know, again, like I said, that we're dealing with it right now, too. Uh, for those, for students out there, we're a month away from school, a month away, and all these decisions need to be made right now. How would you, what kind of advice would you give students, these young people out there, on, on what they can do as they sit here right now with all these different possibilities in front of them? Be it's creative, and this is what I mean by that. And I've been talking to a lot of my friends, both kids and, 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 the, and the parents of the kids, um, and, and, it, and they're pulling their hair out. Nobody knows what to do. Nobody knows what comes next. And part of the problem is they're totally committed to try and go back to where they were. Everybody wants to go back to sleep. We've had a wake up call and everybody wants to go back to sleep. Mm -hmm. And I think the key thing for us now is to realize things are going to be different. And for, the, for this moment in time, we should step out of our expectations, we should step out of the norm, and we should begin to think creatively about what we can do in this moment. I don't know what the next moment holds. I do know that it won't be what we knew before. And so trying to pretend that we can go back or that we need to go back or that we need to constrain ourselves with the way in which things were before is going to be frustrating and difficult and depressing. And we need to shed that and move on to say, this is, a, this is a moment in time. This is an historical moment in time. How I act in this moment in time is important. And we should act with integrity and creativity. And we should not be depressed because we can't go back to the past. We should be looking for a future that we care, we care about and engages us even more. Um, again, that's, uh, I couldn't agree more. Um, do you feel that given what you just said, putting that into practice to a certain extent for anybody who's watching this is to think, uh, almost think of this as an opportunity to maybe do a path less obvious for you? Yeah. Well, think, you know, to me, I kind of liken it to all those apocalyptic movies everybody loves. So why do people love apocalyptic movies? You know, the world has been devastated. All the buildings have been blown out. You know, there are Mad Max trucks everywhere. Why is that interesting? And it's interesting because the past doesn't exist anymore. It's all the future. Everything is new. And yeah, it's, yeah, it's hard and, it's, and there's constraints. And, and it's, and, but none of the past applies. And so today we need to think, I think, very similarly around the sort of the apocalypse of the moment and the opportunity of the future. Everybody here has a get out of jail free card right now. I mean, yes, if you've got a huge mortgage, yes, if you've got three kids in college, these things are difficult and you're gonna to have to figure out how to deal with them. But if you're particularly young and, um, and, and not, and not constrained by obligation responsibility. This moment in time, you get to make what you want of it. Nobody's going to judge you on it. I was just, because, gonna, I was just gonna ask you about that. Yeah. For somebody who's thinking about, let's say they're already, they've been accepted to college or they're in the middle of college. Um, do you, I was gonna ask you that question. If you feel like, um, if, if they feel internal pressure to continue on that path, 
because they're concerned about what the repercussions will be if they don't go along that path. Do, do you feel that this is a moment in time where you will not, well, you did answer that, that you won't be judged in that kind of way. So it's kind I, of- an- I think that's right. I mean, I, I think fast forward two years from now, and people will be, if you're sitting in, a, in, 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 a, in an office, you know, God forbid, you know, in an interview um, with, for a job, and somebody said, what did you do two years ago? You know, saying that I sort of persevered and went to class when I didn't care about it or stayed in university, even though I was living at home with my parents doing it online or, you know, those answers are not going to be very interesting. To say that you sort of went off and created something different, a life that's different, you know, that you went off and did something that mattered, that to you, that you grew and, and, and expanded during this period of time, that's valuable. I mean, this is that apocalyptic moment where you get to do whatever is important going forward without being constrained by the past. Yeah. Fascinating stuff. Um, we're almost at the hour. That's fascinating stuff. Any other questions for Randy? before we let him go. Any others? I thought, uh, for Randy, that was a fascinating session to me. Like that, it was wonderful to just kind of hear your perspectives on it. And now it's very clear why you're, a not that it wasn't before, that why it's so clear that you're a teacher, that you're a mentor, that you're, you know, the kind of the wisdom that you can share with everybody. And I would definitely like to have you back on again at some point. Um, for all the, uh, Chris asked another, well, Christina first says, just really powerful, amazing perspectives. So true. And then Chris asked, what music are you listening to right now? Well, so, I, I mean, my journey through music has been, you know, is, is always moving around. I, I will tell you that up until recently, I've only wanted to hear live jazz. So there's a wonderful club here in Santa Cruz called Kumba. Wonderful club. Probably one of the best clubs in the United States outside of New York. And, um, and, uh, and so I have been... I was, I was spending two nights a week there easily for the last year until unfortunately it closed. But live jazz, and, 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 and here's why I say live jazz, this is what's important. Um, I, I don't like things that are performed, I like things that are created. And, and you know, when, when Peter and I talk about this session, I, I have no interest in sitting here and lecturing. I mean, we've done this all free form. This is completely free form. We are not performing, we are creating together. And so finding those opportunities in life, in the arts, in music, in jazz, that to me is inspiring. Great. So Randy, where can people get more of your thoughts? Can you just um, send them to the, what's the book that you recommend? Because you've written several. Yeah, so, so there's a lot of video on there. So if you go to YouTube, you can sort of pick one out. Some are probably better than others. Um, there's the, 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 there's four books I've written. One is kind of a small book called I, I, I effing love that company, which is just about, um, marketing. It's a fa I, I work with a friend of mine who has a, you could argue a fashion company. It's sort of the, the, the new Levi's called American giant, wonderful, wonderful guy. And so, you know, I wrote that book, but my first book was the monk and the riddle. That's about the, the heart and soul of entrepreneurship and innovation. I think for, so for a newbie to the, to the area, that's a good area. It's good place to start because it's very accessible. My other two books were much more about the specifics of innovation. One called Getting to Plan B, about how plans fail and how we should discover our plans through experience. That's a creative process. And then the other, the last book I just wrote, which uh, last book, uh, most recent book called um, Straight Talk for Startups, which is really short chapters, a hundred short chapters on uh, the very simple ideas of how you actually build a new venture or a new idea and make it successful in the context of, of, um, of, of venture capital in, 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 in Silicon Valley. Excellent. Thanks, Randy. Sure. Um, it, it's really been a pleasure to have you on. Great to have you be part of this creative university. Very organic. It's a very organic journey that this is taking. It's a living, breathing organism that's for all you guys out there who are watching this and the people you know. Bring your comments in, bring your suggestions, feedback in because it's for you. But so gratified that the response that we've been getting from people like you, Randy, has been, uh, it's been great. And we've, we've already received, most importantly from the students coming in, some great ideas. So hope that people are really a part of this because I think we've tapped into something. And 
your participation here is demonstrative of that. It was it was really wonderful. And we'll, we'll make th thanks so much for including me. I love doing it, and uh, you know, stay passionate, stay creative. Yeah. All right, everybody. Until next time, the next session is going to be next uh, Tuesday. Remember when we're going to talk about music. <laughs> Adios, everybody. Thank right. you. See you, everybody. Thanks, Randy. Thanks.